Hey guys, Kevin here with the Honey Badger. So I've gotten quite a few requests in the last by about two weeks to do a walk around of the car to provide some more details of where it's at. I've done a few videos, or I should say I've done quite a few videos recently of, uh, of narrower perspectives on the car, meaning, you know, completing this item, uh, changing this out, minor upgrades, some diagnosing, stuff like that. But I haven't done a kind of a full walkthrough of where the car sits today, what the plans are, that kind of stuff for it. So for those of you that are interested in that type of thing this will be a good opportunity for me to practice more filming and for those of you that are interested in that kind of content it'll also provide some additional content for you all right so looking at it now i'd say we are about i'd say the best way to describe it is we are close to getting ready to cage the car although we're about a year away from when i plan to do that i actually plan to do that next summer when the the uh, weather turns again it gets so hot that nobody really goes out and drives uh, that's about the stage we're at. So, you know, the engine's built. The engine's just an absolute monster. You can run it as long as you want. I have had no indication of fuel or uh, of oil starvation. The, it runs as long as you want it to in whatever conditions you want. So the engine is great. Um, I'd say there are three main things left to really work on um, before we're, you know, kind of at that full race car status. Brakes, suspension, and uh, caging. There's obviously a lot of stuff in there, but those are kind of the three buckets that are left for me on kind of where I'm focusing. So if you're counting, there's probably only four, <laughs> and the only one I've really gotten narrowed down is the engine. But more or less, I'm happy with kind of the reliability of the drivetrain. The next step is to work on suspension, caging, and brakes, like I said. And for me, I'm looking at doing the caging next, then the suspension, and then the brakes. A lot of people switch to the brakes right away because you can get cheaper consumables, tires are cheaper, and uh, obviously they perform better. But since I put the brake ducts in, I'm not losing a lot to the AP Racing Kit as far as performance from what I'm able to gather uh, running with friends that have the AP Kit. It's really for me just about the tire choices and obviously the unshed weight. While I'm not discounting the performance benefits, I just don't think the investment is there for me yet. I would rather cage than do suspension and then fit, you know fix the brakes because I do plan to do all four corners versus just up front. That's about a $10,000 investment. So I'd rather cage and, and do suspension, as I said, since I can do both of those for the cost of you know, the brakes, more or less, give or take. All right, and then so taking a look in the inside of the car here, the entire interior has been removed. I've pulled probably about 200 to 250 pounds out of the interior uh, from a stock form and then added the roll bar back in. So I'd say we're easily about 200 pounds lighter than a stock car if you, you know, if you were to take this exact car compared to a stock car just on the interior. You know, the, the glass weighs 30 pounds a piece on, for each one of the doors. The doors are gutted. You know, all the plastic and all the carpet and all that kind of stuff has been removed. A bunch of the stereo components, the center console, all kind of stuff comes out to about, I want to say, 160 to 180 pounds, if I remember the math correctly. And then, the, you know, the big one for me is I had the convenience package seats, and these seats are so much lighter. I mean, I think this, I think it was 58 pounds versus 30 or something like that. So that was a pretty substantial amount. Uh, removed as well. So as you can imagine the car is very loud on the inside now not just from the you know the rowdy exhaust but overall the car is just very loud. It's very metallic -y now. You hear every little thing happening. It's only going to get louder. So that was a little bit of a bummer when the full interior was still in the car. The car sounded the best then. You heard the motor and you heard the exhaust and you didn't really hear much else. Now you hear everything. You hear the resonance of a car. You hear little tiny things nicking and you know hitting stuff underneath the car. So it's just very loud and, and audibly uh, overwhelming to a lot of people. So it's to the point now where when I give rides to people, they typically wear uh, uh, ear protection or you know they're just well informed to begin with that it's going to be pretty rowdy. So still left to do in the interior. Obviously, it's going to be a roll cage and a you know safety setup. That's next, of course. Um, as well as I need to take the HVAC system out of the front here. I have not removed the dash of this car yet, so there's still some some weight to be shed from there. I'm hoping the center console there. If you're wondering why that's still there, is the way the system, the computers work in the car. The start stop button does obviously a lot more than just ignition on and ignition off. Uh, starter motor on, all that kind of stuff. So. I have not found a way yet with the, keeping the majority of the car's computers intact how to separate those out yet, so I'm still stuck with that. And rather than pull that board out and just put it somewhere else and cut everything, I've been hoping to uh, figure out a, a cleaner way to do that where I can actually separate all that stuff from each other, but we'll see. Time will tell. 
Um, the other thing that's uh, of interest in here is I have a, um, I've put my lithium ion battery in here. And if you're wondering why would you put a lithium ion battery, oh, I didn't know you guys can't see that super well. But if you're wondering why you would move the lithium ion battery inside the car and not just keep it in the, the engine bay, uh, two reasons. One, I wanted it to be more easily accessible uh, from, you know, when the car's hot or it's raining or I want to charge it, any that type of stuff. It's just easier to work on, see, and have access to when it's back here, as well as this option gives me much more space if I want to uh, change battery sizes, location, or battery types, sizes, all that kind of stuff. Right now I'm running this really great little lithium ion by anti-gravity. It's uh, the ATX 20 HD. It's been phenomenal, completely flawless for me. Highly recommend. Um, and then if we head over to the other side, couple interesting things here um, for us is we've done some dash removal in this area too so you can see this little panel up here the little blue light that's an LED light to let me know when the accu sump that I have in the trunk is on and it's you know the the valve is open I should say the switch next to it in the middle that is the accu sump on off valve so mine's electric con electrically controlled and it opens when oil pressure is less than 37 psi which is really handy so when I am out on track if the oil pressure were to ever drop below 37 psi because of fuel or oil starvation it would automatically release the three quarts and then as you can probably guess the the one on the far right with the red that is going to be the uh, battery disconnect so uh, the S550 is a little bit more challenging to do a full um, battery or I should a full electrical shut off on because of this the smart charging alternator and some other stuff. So this is just a battery disconnect. Um, the battery is, or I should say, computer, it's the ECM shutoff switch really is, I guess the best way to describe it. The battery is still connected to the alternator and the starter motor. Um, it's directly connected to those two, but all the car's electronics, fuel pump, um, PCM, all that stuff, the entire battery distribution box, all that is uh, controlled now by that shutoff switch. Other uh, interesting things here is this is what I use for my cool shirt system. Um, I don't actually have the cool shirt brand. This is an ultra chiller. I really liked this because the mounting is really sweet. I mean, it's really flexible on where you need to mount it. You don't need a big splat spot, big flat spot to mount it to. It's very light. Uh, it's super easy. I actually really love this form factor. It's uh, been really nice. My only complaint is on a really, really, really hot day with your standard type of ice, meaning just, you know, getting crushed, not crushed ice, uh, cubed ice and putting it in there, you only get about 35 minutes out of it. So it's definitely not built for endurance racing. I mean, it's got no insulation. So it, it bleeds off the, the cool uh, energy uh, very quickly. So other than that, I'll have a more in-depth video of that actually when I'm at Coda next weekend testing and running and I can actually use it and I'll, I'll give you guys more feedback on it. All right, and lastly, new to the car that I have are going to be the comms down here. I just got this. Uh, we'll be testing this weekend at Coda. It's a speed comm intercom system. It allows me to talk between me and my passenger as well as a, it is removable and powered by battery so I can use it with you know, novice uh, drivers when I'm instructing, but this will allow me and the passenger to be connected to each other and talk, which is great because the as soon as you start moving in this car, it's so loud you have no chance of communicating. I have mine runs uh, just up here, hangs right above my halo seat, and then for the passenger, they'll have a student headset that they can slip into a helmet and then connect it into there. As mentioned before, this is going to be the AccuSump system that I'm running. So uh, this guy holds three quarts of. Uh, oil uh, pressurized at whatever uh, PSI it was at when it you know the valve opened so I think right now because it filled up when the engine was idling it's you know at 70-ish uh, PSI um, so that uh, that holds three quarts and when this valve is told to open because of the oil pressure it uh, pushes the oil and then I have a bulkhead fitting that then sends the line underneath the car so it's you know not sneaking through the car where I'm at so yeah this is fantastic you know when you're doing a cold start or the car hasn't been run for a while this is a nice way to pre-oil the engine as well as if anything goes wrong uh, on track it can inject oil in your system before you know things go crazy all right and this is something I haven't talked about yet didn't make a video because honestly it was uh, I was doing it very late at night uh, and I didn't really have a plan I kind of just started monkeying around and seeing what could work 
but I have removed my trunk latch um, because my, with the battery frequently being disconnected, getting out of the, in and out of the trunk was a pain, and I accidentally killed one battery by needing to get into the trunk, turning the battery on, getting what I needed out of the trunk, shutting the trunk, and walking away. Because that is powered by a solenoid, not a, a full switch, or not a, um, not a natural switch that you know, just cuts power. It controls a solenoid in the engine bay. It draws a little bit of power, and if you leave it on long enough, it can drain the battery down. So the system I have here is I actually just got two um, of these hood latches. These are the same hood latches I use on the front. Or, um, and I, you know, obviously, as you can see, drilled them in. And then what I did here is I drilled through this section. I plated it on both sides so there's some extra support. And then I just added a, a spacer here because it wasn't tall enough. It's really simple. It's really easy to do. You could do it yourself probably in, oh, I don't know, hour and a half maybe, not too bad. No welding or anything like that. And all you gotta do is, you know, the other thing I did, I should say, is because I removed all the plastics here, my trunk had nothing to push down on under high force. So I got these bump stops off of Amazon. They're just, for, I think for a Jeep, if I remember correctly. But they're just polyurethane, they're very tough. And then I adjusted these so that the height is such that when uh, the trunk is closed, it just sits on them. Or I should, sorry, it just sits on them, which gives me enough uh, down, uh, enough support so that when the trunk is closed like this you know I'm not rubbing down there which is really nice so it's really handy the trunk open and closes now just by pushing those two one on each side don't need electricity been fantastic all right and then uh, next up here we have the wheel and tire package and a couple other things so for brakes I run the Raybestos ST43s up front um, I found those pads to be a really, really good pad for track day duty. They last me eight to 10 plus days and I'm really, really hard on brakes. Um, I'm definitely not the hardest on brakes by any means, but I, I would say I'm definitely above average hard on brakes and those last me eight to 10 days. They're phenomenal. They're about 400 bucks a set. They have a really good initial bite so you don't have to push the brake that hard to get a lot of bite out of them. They're, but they're not like overly uh, sensitive. They're street friendly. Uh, you can't really, in my experience, overheat them too easily, or I should say, I haven't been able to overheat them at all, and I had the sweet picture of them glowing at Circuit of the Americas, and they, they've handled that phenomenal, so highly recommend. Um, still running stock in the rear, although I think I need a little bit more pad in the rear now. As I run the wing, it, it just feels, we're fe we feel a little dancy, um, so I would like to add a little bit more rear pad. Um, but. It works. It works just fine. And it's the perfect combo, I think, for a stock aero car, for sure, 100%. Uh, with the aero and stuff that, and the grip the car has now, especially when I run slicks, I definitely recommend um, going up in, you know, pad aggression if you're looking to maximize performance, you know, an ST45 or an ST47, which will be next for me. Uh, as far as wheels, I run signature wheels. I have two sets here. I have the uh, SV502s and the SV503s. I'm a huge fan of these wheels. They weigh, I think it was 21.8 pounds or something ridiculously light like that. And I've personally, you know, smashed them into curbs like at Road Atlanta on one of the black wheels here. I dropped a wheel on the inside of 10A and when it, it, it dropped, you know, four inches down, into the dirt and then it hit an abrupt you know flat straight edge uh, of concrete and you I mean you heard it you could and there was there's um, damage on the inside of the wheel uh, meaning just it was all cosmetic but the wheel held true it was still round somehow miraculously I mean these are tough wheels so you have no you do not have to worry about smashing it and stuff so I highly recommend so I have two sets of those as well as some 6GRs over there in the corner the 6GRs uh, hold rain tires I haven't used them yet. They've been just sitting in that corner for you know a year. They've gone on a few trips with us where you know there was a chance of rain, but they're dedicated wet, so I just kind of keep them as spares. And then I swap my tire duties between these two. I don't really have a uh, plan exactly of you know which wheel gets what type of tire, but generally speaking, I typically have a slick on one set of them and then a cup two type tire on the other. So right now these both have cup twos because I am in the process of switching. Those will be getting Pirelli DHs uh, up here or 
coming in a, you know a couple of days and uh, these will be running my uh, cup twos for the short term and then and then the last thing that I want to cover is going to be for the front I have brake ducts I'll throw a picture on the screen I can't really show you anything but uh, it utilizes up here in the front I added you know I cut this out this section is all OEM this part's new but this whole um, this duct work initially is OEM and I just connected four inch hose to that and I didn't uh, all, literally all I did was duct tape four inch uh, brake duct hosing onto the you know I cut half the OEM duct off and I duct taped it together it's worked fantastic and then I fabricated a uh, steel brake ducting kit that blows the air directly into the inside of the rotor so I'm really it, I mean it's worked fantastic that upgrade alone got me an extra 0.2 braking G's so I mean the car can sustain 1.5 G's now which is just crazy so it works really really well highly recommend uh, and then I should say the second or that was the second to last thing now the last thing is I've been running OEM rotors up until this point the rotors that I have here are the new 2019 flat rotors so they don't have the cross drilled holes and I don't recommend or I, I mean they're fine for the depending on your use case but they're just not working for me so I've as I've started to push the car harder and lap times have gone down and I'm running the arrow and all that kind of stuff and the speeds have gone up my rotors are lasting less and less and less so I think while I got 12 days out of my first set of front rotors I'm now getting four or four and a half days out of them. Uh, these have three days of use on them, and I'm not sure if it'll show you, but they're already micro cracking. Uh, you can kind of see it in the reflection, but we have all these cracks in here. And this is something that I, I don't, I actually, I would say without, I, with, I need more data for sure. I'd have to run a couple more of them, but to me, they don't seem to be any stronger or more durable, and they seem maybe even potentially less durable in regards to the level of heat I'm putting into them than the pre-2019 cross-drilled rotors. I know it doesn't really make sense, but I maybe there was something to the cross-drilled and cooling. I don't know, but these for sure haven't, haven't lasted me that long and I haven't been impressed with them. So what I actually have coming next are some cryo-treated uh, gyro disc rotors. So those um, should last me much longer. The gyro disc, have, from what I've been told, are you know typically last about two times longer than stock. And with the cryo treatment, we'll find out you know if it, you know if that's snake oil or not. I'm excited to try that out. Um, but the place I ordered it from, they stock the rotor and they treat it all in house. So it was super cheap. It was only like a hundred dollars more to get them cryoed. And I was like, might as well try it, see if it works out. So. Uh, those are coming this, uh, should be coming this week or next week. So hopefully I get them in time for Coda. If not, you know, we'll test them afterwards. But um, that should be hopefully a good upgrade. A lot of you guys are going to be very familiar with this part, but just to walk through it in case you haven't, uh, the engine here has been fully built over the winter. I worked with Tim at MPR Racing on the short block and RGR slash JPC on the head work. Uh, the, the short block was um, sleeved with Darton sleeves and then it had an all new rotating assembly with the exception of the original crankshaft. Um, and then on the heads, those were ported, polished, and then upgraded the valve train a bit. So we got, you know, we have the uh, Ferrera, not titanium, but super alloy uh, valves. There we have pack racing springs, titanium uh, retainers, bronze guides. So the, the valve train is very robust now. Um, if you're if you weren't following along in the beginning of this whole thing, what ended up happening to cause me to do the rebuild is I had chipped some valve springs and it had sent metal through the motor. So it wasn't catastrophic. Engine was running fine when I took it apart. All preventative. So internally, the engine is just an absolute monster. Since then, I've done a couple things. I've run the oil lines between the two heads. This is done to help stabilize oil pressure and the oil galleys that power your lash adjusters and stuff, or I should say control your lash, lash adjusters. This is so under high G loads, you have consistent oil pressure between two heads. It also helps uh, keep the engine heads a little bit cooler. My cylinder head temps ran um, about 15 degrees cooler, 10 to 15 degrees cooler. Uh, so that was a nice bonus. Um, cooling, we've installed the FP350S, it's going to be very hard to see with the front bumper on, but the FP350S uh, oil cooler and the, I mimicked the ductwork from the FP350S, so uh, we have 
air is forced into the oil cooler and then there's about a two inch gap between the oil cooler and the radiator and then the air goes through there and, it, and then through the radiator I've obviously removed the air conditioning condenser because I don't have air conditioning anymore uh, as well as there is uh, ductwork to force you know unob unobstructed air into the radiator so between those uh, oh, also the engine has long tube headers from ARH that are ceramic coated uh, the CMC, we've deleted the CMC valves in order to complete that cooling mod I just mentioned between the two heads, or I should say the oil lines between the two heads, uh, as well as we have the, P, I did a PVC, PCV uh, system delete. Now both heads just vent into that Peterson breather that's there in the corner where the battery used to be is now just that little relay I told you about that disconnects all the wiring. Uh, so between all these changes and all these upgrades and, and stuff, uh, like I said, the motor is basically bulletproof so far. Obviously, things can still happen, but uh, it's been just unstoppable. It revs to the moon. I mean, we set a, a red line for 8,500 RPM. We do need a little bit more cam to go higher than that, I think. But um, the motor easily could rev up to over 9,000 if you want it to. I typically shift about 7,800 because that's peak horsepower and it's just nicer on the motor. But motor's basically bulletproof. I mean, I was at Coda in 100 degree weather in the middle of July, and I did 30 to 40 minute sprints in the motor, and it just, nothing. I mean, it just stayed at 280 degree oil temps, cylinder head temps, you know, like 240. I mean, it's just bulletproof. So it's been, it's been really, really great. Uh, the motor's super strong. And then as far as aero, we have an APR splitter up front. I would recommend the FP350S splitter. Uh, I installed the splitter right when the FP350S splitter was kind of becoming uh, publicly available. I chose this at the time because I didn't realize, honestly, that it wasn't going to work with the R, the GT350R OEM splitter. If I were to do it again, I would obviously get the FP350S splitter. Um, we have the APR uh, canards here, dive planes, if you will, I should say. Uh, those, have, those were a really nice recent addition. And then as you, I'm sure you can see, massive venting. So the side vents are gonna be from Carter's Custom. The center vent is, was a trial vent made out of fiberglass that was a replica of the OEM uh, GT4 Mustang hood vent. It, um, I, as far as I know, they didn't make any more of them. They do, have, they do struggle a little bit with the under hood temperature. So if you're looking to do this you know, similar aero setup, I would just go with full Carter Customs uh, venting or even better would be the OEM GT4 or I should say the Multimatic slash Core Motorsport GT4 carbon fiber vents they'll be lighter, stiffer, stronger but also a lot more money I also added these side vents to help reduce uh, any pressure underneath the fender here and depending on which fender you're looking at it's going to be a little hard to see but I've massively vented the uh, fender liner so that uh, there's a lot less um, pressure and, and lift coming from under there and then of course, as you can see here, it's no, no, uh, it's hard to miss. On the back is we have the APR GT250 wing. Um, I will say that if you're looking to do something similar, I would recommend starting with the, uh, I would recommend starting with coilovers. This, this system will easily overwhelm um, a stock car's ability to handle the suspension. I did it one because I had cracked a, a spoiler and I needed to replace it and I just decided to go this path um, if you're trying to do it the correct way, like I said, you'll want to stick with, you know, OEM R Aero, uh, which the car is perfectly capable of handling. It's a very complete package, especially when you uh, combine it with the uh, Ford Performance lowering springs and Ford Performance uh, sway bars. This car also runs both of those. Not to say that this is completely unusable on this car. There's definitely a time and a place for it. It is very nice to be able to tune your rear wing uh, angle of attack, which you know, on a short track, you can get a lot more bite around corners. On a, you know, a fast track, you can reduce the, the, the angle of attack and, and have less squat in the rear and less lift in the front comparatively. So it definitely has benefits, but completely unneeded uh, unless you're just four wheel drifting into every turn because you're carrying so much speed. All right, and then the last thing would be data. So I get this a lot too is, you know, what are you using to gather data and all that kind of stuff. And so I use an AIM Solo 2 DL to gather the data from the ECM or the ECU, sorry, as well as provide the overlay data that then goes to the camera. And then lastly, of course, it gives me all of my telemetry data about, you know, lap times and, and braking and all that kind of stuff. Super important tool. That is one of the first things you should buy if you're looking to get faster on track. 
And then the second thing going to be hard to see here uh, is going to be this Smarty Cam, which apparently I don't think you can see at all. But there, I have a Smarty Cam in here that uh, is a very, very pricey little camera that connects to your AIM Solo. They're made by the same company, and they're, the Smarty Cam is worth every penny, I promise you. So the AIM Solo turns on automatically when I go out on track. So as soon as I get on the track surface, I go, I think it's above 30 miles an hour, it turns on and it starts recording my session, giving me lap time data, all that kind of stuff. Because it's connected directly to the Smarty Cam, it does the same thing. So I can go an entire track day without ever turning a camera on, managing a camera, doing any of that stuff. All you gotta do is jump in the car and go out. It's phenomenal, especially if you're busy because you're instructing or you know just generally want to hang out with friends and not manage cameras and all that kind of stuff super quick the data that's coming from the aim is auto, or the solo is automatically overlaid onto the data uh, or onto the video footage that the camera is capturing in real time which means when you end a session you can pop the SD card out put it in your computer and in 15 seconds be watching your your overlaid footage it's phenomenal highly recommend it all right, guys, so I think that's going to do it. I think I got everything on the car, uh, at least at a high level, but, of course, I, there's a pretty good chance I missed something Now um, that I'll probably remember at a later point. But if you have any questions or any feedback or anything like that, please drop me a comment. I'm always looking. I'm happy to help and answer questions and, and all that kind of good stuff. So uh, have a great night. Thanks for watching. Hopefully I get to see you at the track.